Right, good morning party people and welcome to Office Hours, the first live Office Hours stream I've done from the office studio in a while. Uh, DK Kimbo's over there in chat, good morning. Marky Twitcher says good morning. Uh, yeah, I've been on the road for like a month straight traveling all over Europe. Uh, and uh, Code with Sean, hello Code with Sean. Uh, so uh, it's the, like the first time in forever that I've been able to work from home and do an office hours. And of course, right at that exact moment, I get a phone call from a cruise line agent. It's really, it's almost bizarre. Uh, oh, hi. Good morning, Chitan. Um, I got a, a voicemail yesterday saying I'd earned a free cruise from Norwegian Cruise Lines. And I was like, yeah, right. Come on. We all know how that goes. But it turns out, yes, I actually had from my uh, cruise last year where uh, on the cruise ship, the the internet was down, so all we could do was really like gamble when the ship was at sea, like gamble or go to the spa or read books or whatever. So I ended up gambling a lot, and we won a free cruise from our uh, play on the casino. And I was like, well, okay, well, that's one way to do it, which then immediately set off my paranoia alarms. I was like, well, so did they purposely make the internet suck just so that I would go to the casino? You'd think like that I would gamble a lot because I live in Las Vegas. We never gamble at home. We never gamble in Las Vegas at all. Uh, every now and then, like if we have a really long restaurant wait and we're near slot machines, we might put 20 bucks in a casino or in a, a slot machine, but that would be about it. Uh, but for some reason, I cruise when I go cruising with people, there are a couple of folks that I cruise with who love to gamble, so we do usually do blackjack. So we got a bunch of good questions that have piled up recently from the poll gab queue. Let's go take a look and see what we got here. The top question is from World Peace, who says, Hey Brent, I'm working in Azure currently, and the Azure architect is placing all the MDF and LDF files on one drive and saying that it's a better setup than uh, creating separate data and log drives. Are the previous ways of creating a database server no longer valid? When a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, when you had separate physical drives, with each with their own throughput, and the throughput was fairly limited, people would sometimes say, I'm going to get more throughput uh, by separating data and log files. And then they would also have different settings for those data and log volumes. The log volume might be tuned for writes, whereas the data volume might be tuned for reads. And then over time, storage, local storage, got so fast, and, and solid state storage that was attached to a network, got so fast that that became a dumb idea again. Then for a while in the cloud, it did make sense to separate data and log files uh, drives on, or files under different drives, uh, different volumes, because cloud storage is so catastrophically slow. These days, I have totally different guidance, and I teach it to you in my Faster, Cheaper Cloud Databases class. The punchline in there is that it really depends on how you're configuring your volumes. Most of the time, it's easier to set one big Windows RAID array, one Windows software RAID, and then when you need capacity, you can just add volumes to that RAID array, as opposed to trying to micromanage which volumes have the most capacity and speed and how you're going to carve those up. The sad thing with cloud storage is that it performs really, really poorly, so you end up buying way more capacity than you need just to get the performance that you want. You have to usually stripe together several one terabyte drives to get the performance that you want in Azure. Uh, DBA Duck says, good morning, howdy, good to see you, sir. See, next up we have Bishal who says, I have Azure VMs hosting SQL Server Standard Edition with multiple databases. We reduce our server specs during the weekend and then upgrade them again on Monday in order to save costs. This has downtime of about 10 minutes. Is there any option for this with zero downtime? Yes, what you want instead is a reservation. A reservation up in Azure lets you commit to a certain size for a certain period of time, like one year or three years. And when you commit with a reservation, you can save 50, 60, 70 percent. That's way better than just saving a little bit over the weekends. Check out reservations because they even let you uh, change the reservation amount. They let you like exchange different reservation quantities or even get a refund if you want. So it's not really the, even that high of a commitment. That's actually the part of the very first thing I teach in my faster, cheaper cloud databases class. 
two answers in a row plugging that class, which is funny. Shane O'Neill's, hi, howdy, good to see you in here. Karama says, my boss says you don't need to run index maintenance anymore outside of stats updates as fragmentation is not a concern with flash storage. Okay, so check out my, if you go Google for or search on YouTube, Brent Ozar Fragmentation. I've got tons of videos about that. Check out those videos. You'll get lots of education and then you can catch up to your boss. Next up, SQL Heinrich says, Hi Brent, I didn't have the budget for Data Saturday Croatia this year. How was it from your perspective? I thought it was great. I think that most SQL Saturdays are great when you talk about how little they cost. When you say you don't have the budget, I mean, I don't know how it gets cheaper than free. I suppose maybe you're hoping for some event where people actually pay you to attend. I, I don't think you're going to find one of those anytime soon. Or if you do, it's probably going to have some material you're not really interested in watching because they're just like a timeshare paying you to sit in a seat while they spam the bejesus out of you. You are going to have travel costs, but that's up to you. You want to find events that are local to you or as close to you as possible. And there are lots of SQL Saturdays and Data Saturdays all over the world. Uh, SQL Heinrich says, how is the SQL Server community there? You know, it, I, I don't know if I could tell you. When you say, how is the community, it's such a, a generic question. I, I don't know what kind of answer you're looking for there. He says, and do you plan on being there next year too? No, but that's just because I try to move around every year. I try to attend different events every year, different regional and international events every year. Uh, for example, this year I'm doing Boston, Houston, Croatia. I'm trying to think of the other ones that I did earlier in the year. But then I won't do those events again. Next year I'll go off to different places depending on, because I don't want to travel to see the same place every single year if I can avoid it. I'd rather jump around and see different places. <laughs> DK Kimbo says uh, uh, SQL timeshares is a good example, but wait, that's the cloud. Yes, yes, where's my, yes, time, that's, DK Kimbo, that's a genius analogy. I absolutely love it. Timeshares in the cloud. So Very Tired says, neither transactional nor merge replication are in my toolbox. Do they take long to learn and are they worth learning? I, they're not in my toolbox either. In my experience, they're the kinds of things that if the company needs it, they tend to have several people on the team who use it and are very familiar with it. So if you don't already have a job for a company working, a company like that, working with a transactional and merge replication, don't bother learning. Wait until you get a job at one of those companies because it's not going to be the primary thing that you work with. You're going to have other things in SQL Server that you work with. And they can very easily catch you up to speed on transactional and merge replication when you need it. Otherwise, you may go your whole career without needing it. I haven't used it in 14 years. I can tell you that with certainty because the last time I used it was 2012 and I remember exactly what that scenario was. Next up, let's see, Flash Sentry says, specifically for availability groups, what should I look for in a monitoring tool? Most of them just regurgitate a DMV. So for me, I would say you probably don't want to buy a monitoring tool just for AGs. You want to buy a monitoring tool that meets lots of criteria. So what you want to do is make a list of everything that you need to monitor and then try the trials of each different popular monitoring tool. Then when I say try it, I don't just mean install it and click around and go, oh yeah, that's pretty. What you want to do is have a list of failures that you want to test. For example, if AGs are important to you, make a list of common scenarios that have bit you with availability groups. And then after you've installed that tool, go recreate that scenario with availability groups where it failed and see how it surfaces itself in the monitoring tool. That way you'll be able to see exactly what you would have seen during that emergency. So it's really helpful. I have the same uh, advice. For example, some clients are looking for help with deadlocks. And I'm like, great, just set up these different monitoring tools, create a deadlock, and watch to see how the monitoring tools surface it to you. And then that'll tell you whether or not you work with that tool and whether or not that tool works for you. Surly Dev, howdy, good to see you. Been a while since I've been in here on Twitch. Um, Tigger asks, what model and size do you use in your local LLM? 
See, I've been, here's the thing. I've been debating whether or not I want to teach anything or blog anything related to AI because the problem is, is that it changes so quickly. For example, I subscribe to Reddit uh, our local llama. His local llama uh, announces all the new LLMs and has like competitions for which ones are the best coding LLMs. And there are all kinds of different uh, uh, standards and benchmarks to gauge them. So because of that, unfortunately, I just don't want to keep pushing out training material that changes every week. Your best bet is to go to the source and go to Reddit's uh, local llama uh, subreddit there. So Surly Dev says, I'm offended you come to Europe and didn't drop in for coffee. Yeah, it's so tough when I travel. Man, it's so, like, every, I, it's funny. Whenever I get back from travel or when someone sees me, I always get, like, 10 emails from people going, don't you remember that I'm in town? And the funniest part is I don't remember that people are in town. I just, there are so many people out there uh, in so many different locations that I just can't keep up with everybody and know where they're at. If someone gave me a quiz and said, you're going to the UK, who should you check up on? And I would have no freaking idea. You know, I would put out a call on, you know, LinkedIn or whatever, but I'm so terrible at that. Um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I used to maintain a good address book. I used to keep, uh, I used to use LinkedIn and Facebook's syncing features so that it would sync my contact book with my local address book. And I had everybody's Facebook and LinkedIn account details so that when I was going to a country, I could put in that country and I'd see a list of everybody in there. But these days, I'm up to like 35,000 LinkedIn connections and I don't know how many Facebook connections because I just attach, you know, anybody who requests, I just attach. Uh, it, unless it's a recruiter, I have a thing about recruiters. Uh, but so because of that, I just don't, I, I ended up declaring contacts bankruptcy. I deleted all my contacts and started all over again. So I have no idea where anybody is. I'm a terrible traveler. Next up, Jerry says, could you explain data partitioning in SQL Server to someone new to it? Yes, go to brentozar.com slash go slash partitioning brentozar.com slash go slash partitioning. We have tons of free resources on there. We explain use cases. We tell you what to look out for, tell you when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. All that is totally free at brentozar.com slash go slash partitioning. Uh, Cheetan says, create a table of people with location, name, phone number, and email, and please meet us. The, the reality is, is that there are just too many people. I mean, they're literally, I have 35,000 LinkedIn connections, you know, like my odds of, then I have to sink in to people I know from Twitch or people I know from BSky or whatever. It's just not worth it. What I do instead is I just publish my schedule out there on the site. Uh, people can see where I'm going to different conferences. And then sometimes they email me and go, Hey, you know, I'd like to meet up with you at this time. And then I respond with, well, my travel schedule's already booked usually, so it's pretty tough. Next up, my tea got cold says, have you ever found a use case for incremental statistics? No. No, I have not. Sorry. Pretty easy answer though. Next question, Marcus the German says, Hi, I have a simple select star from table, no filtering. The query runs for eight seconds, but the plan says it's just taking 900 milliseconds. Do you have any hints? Yes, put in a where clause. Only get the rows that you want. The reason that it's taking eight seconds is that it's pouring all kinds of results into Management Studio. SQL Server's bored out of its gourd. You, you need to put a where clause on your queries. Next up, the Pinder asks, what's the max number of databases that you recommend for a single availability group and what are the warnings for exceeding this number? Google for what not to do availability groups. There's a fantastic post by Warwick Rudd that explains the problem with worker thread exhaustion. It's what not to do availability groups. And he explains what happens uh, when you add too many databases in. Because of that, my general guideline for folks, I almost said rule, but guideline, is if you're going to have more than 100 databases on a server on one primary replica, then you probably want to think about either splitting that SQL server up between many, like using virtualization, or you probably want a different high availability and disaster recovery plan. Because the number of databases you have is only going to get worse 
it's only going to get higher over time. So even when you're already at 100, you may hit problems with worker thread exhaustion. There are scenarios where you don't. Like if you have a thousand databases that aren't doing anything, you may be able to pull it off. But the more active the databases are, the more you're going to have problems with that, as Warwick Rudd explains. Just a really good post. Next up, Mirza says, what is the technology in Azure that you recommend we focus on if we only have on-premises experience as a DBA? Is it just Azure SQL database or do we need to have working knowledge of other tools? Go check out my class, uh, SQL, running SQL Server in Azure and AWS, and I explain the different options up there. I explain use cases for each of the options so that you know which ones make sense for you to learn. That's if you go to brentozar.com, click training up at the top, and then check out the uh, running SQL Server in the cloud class. And it's cheap, too. And then we'll do one more. One CTE to rule them all says, should I CTE or not CTE? Help me be kind to myself and others. Do you gain performance under the hood using them? T-SQL is a declarative language where you're declaring the shape of your result sets. You're not declaring the shape of the execution plan. Although you can, there are hints that you can put in that will govern how SQL Server does the plan. But generally speaking, CTEs, subqueries, there's all kinds of things that you can do with T-SQL that just explain to SQL Server what's the data that you want. If you get to the point, and so what I would tell you is write your queries in a way that are easy to understand first. The easier that they are for a human being to understand, the better off you're going to be with the query optimizer. When you get to the point where you're hitting performance walls and you need to rewrite to fix things, then check out one of two resources. Either check out my Mastering Server Tuning class or Itzik Ben-Gan's book, uh, T-SQL Querying. So either my Mastering Server Tuning class or Itzik Ben-Gan's book on T-SQL querying, and both of those can teach you how to rewrite T-SQL, depending on which one of those learning methods that you prefer, will teach you how to rewrite existing T-SQL in a more performant way. I wish that I could tell you, always use this tool or never use this tool, but that wouldn't make sense, right? It's not like if you're a carpenter, you go, well, always use the hammer. Never use a screwdriver or a saw. That just doesn't make sense. We have to use different tools to accomplish different goals depending on what we're trying to do. And by asking, should I use a hammer, you're really exposing that maybe it's time for you to report to class or grab a book. All right, there we go. There's a whole bunch of questions inside there. I will now, oh my gosh, it's a beautiful day over in Las Vegas. We had thunderstorms roll through yesterday, and so the temperature went from 106 degrees Fahrenheit down to 72 Fahrenheit this morning. It's now back up to 80. So I'm going to go get outside, take the dog for a walk around the block. They, I've already taken Beanie out once, and I'm going to take him out twice in one morning. He's going to absolutely lose his mind. So I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.